This program is brought to you by Emory University. Thank you. I'm actually dropping the word Appalachian from my title and just talking about Southern American fiddle repertoire. <clears throat> this is a paper that I've wanted to write, thought about writing for a good long time, and I thought needed to be written. It's, um, so I'm grateful to Jim for the opportunity to um, give a first take at it here, and I'm going to be presenting it again, probably in a revised version at a conference that Finton is, um, has organized for later in the summer. Um, it was in many, case, many ways a very difficult paper to write, but as I said, it was one that I thought needed to be written, and there's some things that I thought needed to be said. So I expect a lot of feedback from this, and I hope we will engender some discussion. This is a somewhat more formal academic paper than, than John's presentation, but that's sort of the way I run. So, three or four years ago, while attending Breaking Up Winter, an annual old-time music festival held every March in Cedars of Lebanon State Park near Lebanon, Tennessee, I was playing guitar in a nice jam session in which two fiddler friends, Michael and Roy, were holding forth in fine fashion. At my request, we played Indian Ate the Woodchuck, a driving three-strain tune associated with the legendary Kentucky fiddler Ed Haley. After a good few times through the tune, the musicians took a bit of a breather, and as often happens, the folks present fell into conversation about the piece just played. In response to someone's query about what the tune's origins might have been, my friend Roy piped up and said, it's Irish. This comment took me by surprise, as I know that Roy, although a fine old-time fiddler, is not particularly knowledgeable about Irish music. When I pushed a bit and asked why he thought it was an Irish tune, he replied simply, it's got to be. Another time, while visiting friends in northwest Washington state, one couple of my acquaintance hosted a house concert by fiddler Randall Bays. Although Randall is an American native, he is well known as a fine exponent of Irish fiddling. Many members of the audience were friends and neighbors of the host couple and had come more out of curiosity than because of any particular fondness for or prior exposure to Irish music. Because of this, the hostess felt obliged to offer some introductory remarks to help put the music in context for the people that were about to hear, hear it. Put the, put the music people were about to hear in some sort of context. She talked at some length about how Irish traditional music was the source of much American old time music, particularly that of the Appalachian region. And in a subsequent discussion with her about this topic, she went so far as to speculate that perhaps there had been druids in the southern mountains who had been responsible for the transmission of the music. Seriously. I offer these two anecdotes to illustrate some of the conventional wisdom regarding the relationship between Irish and Southern American traditional music. Note that in one instance, the speaker is a person well-versed in old-time music and not so much in Irish music, while on the other, the opposite is true. The assumption that there is a strong link between the two musical worlds and that one forms a significant source of the other is remarkably widespread in today's culture. Among other things, this assumption drives a great deal of musical programming. The Chieftains, the band that arguably has been the face of Irish traditional music for the past 50 years, have recorded not one, not two, but three CDs in which they collaborate with some of Nashville's top musicians. These efforts began with Another Country in 1992, and continued with a pair of more recent releases, Down the Old Plank Road in 2002 and further down the Old Plank Road the following year. In the liner notes to another country, Patty Maloney, the leader of the Chieftains, discusses his longstanding interest in what he called the influence and relationship of Irish music to country music. American bluegrass musician Tim O'Brien has recorded two CDs that explore the connections theme, The Crossing from 1999 and Two Journeys in 2001. Last year, 2011, saw the release of Country Crossroads, the, the Nashville Sessions by Cherish the Ladies, and Greengrass Bluegrass, Roots Music from Ireland and America by the Brock McGuire Band. In the interest of full disclosure, I must note that I contributed a brief essay to this last name CD at the invitation of my friend Paul Brock. And I'm here to tell you folks that those are 250 of the most carefully chosen words I've ever written. Comments in the user reviews on Amazon.com provide further evidence of the degree to which the connections between Irish music and American country music are assumed to exist. Listener Barry Bowman writes of Tim O'Brien's The Crossing, if you are at all interested in Celtic slash fusion, this is for you. I am also interested in the Celtic roots of American and Appalachian music. This album perfectly traces these roots. Another listener writing under the name DJ Joe Sixpack characterizes the chieftains down the old plank road as Another all-star country Celtic guest fest, exploring once again the centuries-old link between Irish folk and American country and bluegrass music. Music journalists are equally certain of the role that Irish music played in the history of American country music. 
The Amazon.com listing for the Chieftains in Another Country includes a brief review by veteran music writer Jeffrey Himes, who has written for the Washington Post, for Rolling Stone, National Public Radio, and many other respected outlets. Himes begins his description of the CD with a statement, it is a truism, a truism, that Irish music was the basis of many of the Appalachian ballads and dance tunes that in turn evolved into country music. Of Down the Old Plank Road, Amazon quotes St. Louis music writer Roy Caston. Now the bluegrass is again momentarily cool, leave it to the chieftains to again plunge an all-star country cast into the Celtic wellsprings of old time music, just as they did 10 years ago. Now in addition to CD projects, public programming that plays up the connections theme is similarly abundant. This past September, a concert in New York City by Master Ilan Piper, Jerry O'Sullivan, and old time musician Rafe Stefanini was built on the idea that, quote, Jerry and Rafe will explore the many links between Irish and American traditional music. A little over a month ago, a much more ambitious program titled Celtic Appalachia was staged at Symphony Space in New York City, under the aegis of that city's Irish Arts Center. This show featured several leading Irish American musicians, together with bluegrass and old time players from the Crooked Road region of Southwest Virginia. Promotion for the concert enticed music lovers with the appeal. This St. Patrick's season, join us for a real toe tapping, knee slapping, singing and dancing fete, celebrating the Irish traditional influences on American old time country and bluegrass music. The notion of the Celtic roots of bluegrass is a strong subthread in the larger picture of the connections premise. I know from personal experience that state and regional arts councils in the South receive numerous grant applications from local arts presenters seeking support for performances by Irish or Irish American musical groups. Justification for these performances or for these applications is offered on the basis of how the music of these groups can inform audiences about the roots of American traditional music, especially bluegrass. In 2005, the North Texas Irish Festival, an annual weekend-long event that bills itself as the largest Celtic festival in the Southwest US, adopted as its theme, Bluegrass Has Green Roots. Bluegrass musician Ricky Skaggs, who has participated in some of the recording projects noted above, is well known for having developed an interest in Irish music in recent years. On the Three Pickers CD that he did with guitarist Doc Watson and the recently deceased banjo virtuoso Earl Scruggs, Skaggs introduces one of his original compositions by talking about going to Ireland and encountering Irish music. After noting that he had thought so long and hard about the roots of bluegrass music that it wasn't no strain at all for me to jump right in and play the tunes I knew, and they mixed right in with the tunes they knew, and many of them were the same tunes, just with different names. The context in which Skaggs made these comments did not allow him to be explicit about what these tunes might have been. But one wishes that historian Grady McQuiney had been more specific in his own discussion of shared fiddle traditions. In his 1988 book, Cracker Culture, Celtic Ways in the Old South, McQuiney offers testimony from a couple of Alabama fiddlers on the common repertoire shared by American and what he calls Celtic fiddlers. McQuiney writes, in 1981, after hearing tapes of traditional Irish and Scottish fiddling, James Brock, an outstanding country fiddler from Aliceville, Alabama, said that he recognized many of the tunes which were similar to Southern ones, similar and that he was certain that much traditional Southern music originated in Ireland and Scotland. He continues, Arlen Moon, a skilled instrument maker and old time musician from Holly Pond, Alabama, who heard the same tapes, remarked that the tunes and the fiddling styles were like those he learned from his father and were still played in the rural South. He fiddled some of the same tunes himself and then, to show that he was not simply copying what he had heard, played a tape made earlier in which J.T. Perkins, a traditional fiddler from Arab, Alabama, fiddled a number of tunes that sounded quite Celtic. He then quotes Moon, they ought to sound Irish and Scottish. Most old time, most old time Southern fiddle music came from Ireland and Scotland. So there you have it. Prominent musicians, academic historians, concert promoters, fans and players of both American old time and Irish music, music journalists, all coming down in support of the Celtic slash Irish roots of American traditional music idea. What more could one ask for? Well, at the risk of spoiling the party, I suggest that there is indeed one very important thing missing from this picture evidence. <laughs> there are a great many assumptions being made, but very little in the way of hard evidence is offered in support of them. Claims of this sort require a thorough examination of the history of the American fiddle repertoire and the identifica identification of clear antecedents in the corresponding repertoire of Irish traditional music. As I shall show, this kind of analysis results in a much different picture than that suggested by these assumptions. Now, before proceeding, and perhaps to stave off any incipient lynch mobs that may be forming in the audience, let me hasten to add that I quite agree that there is a strong, discernible component of what these days would be called Celtic music, and this is not the place to argue for or against the appropriateness of that term, in Southern American fiddling. 
However, it is quite clearly a Scottish rather than Irish strain. The widespread assumption about the existence of a strong Irish element in southern fiddling is relatively new. It has become a popular notion only within the past 20 to 25 years. In other words, during the period in which Irish traditional music has risen to unprecedented heights of popularity. Perhaps even more striking than the assumption itself is the degree to which people want it to be true. Why this should be the case is something that I find more than a little perplexing. While I certainly do not claim to be familiar with the entire American fiddle tune repertoire in all time periods and in all regions, I have spent rather a large amount of time over the course of the last 40 years listening to, studying, and playing fiddle music. I'm currently working on a major study of American fiddle tunes that ultimately will be published in the Music of the United States of America series under the aegis of the American Musicological Society. I've also gained considerable knowledge of Irish traditional music in the past 15 or so years. The American fiddle, rep fiddle tune repertoire is large and complex and consists of tunes from many different eras and sources. I have come to think of it as consisting of a number of layers, or more precisely, historical layers. Older imported tunes comprise one of these layers, but one that is relatively small in the overall picture, particularly in the South. Studies of the repertoire, both of individual fiddlers and of multiple players within various areas of the South, reveal that the percentage of tunes that can be clearly traced to old world originals is something on the order of 10 to 15%, maybe 20% if you're lucky, depending on the player. A more or less equal or even greater percentage can be traced to popular culture sources from various eras, ranging from blackface minstrelsy to Tin Pan Alley songs to commercial country music. The remainder, the largest share, are tunes whose histories are difficult or impossible to trace prior to the era of sound recording. Some of these are common across a relatively wide geographic area, while others are strictly local in circulation. Let's turn to a consideration of the broad history of fiddle tunes, and then to how this history relates to the history of the movement of peoples from the old world to the new. The most common form of dance tune that we know today is the reel, known in the southern U.S. as a breakdown or a hoedown a fast tune in 2-4 or 4-4 four, four time. Reels typically consist of two contrasting but often melodically related sections or strains, each of which is played twice for one complete rendering of the tune, giving a, a reel an A-A-B-B -B structure. According to Scottish music and dance historian George Emerson, the reel as a form coalesced in Scotland during the first half of the 18th century. Emerson cites manuscripts containing reels that date from the 1730s and the first public, published collections of Scottish dance music from the decade of the 1750s. What followed from the crystallization of this new form was a period in which composition flourished and a wide repertoire developed. Emerson notes that these earliest collations of Scots tunes from the mid 18th century, quote, were the forerunners of a veritable spate of collections of reels and stress bays set for the violin. The, Excuse me. The span of years from roughly 1780 to 1810 was arguably the greatest period of composition of new reels in Scotland, when the most famous Scottish fiddler composers, such as Neil Gow and his son Nathaniel, and William Marshall, and many others, began composing and publishing prolifically. The Gow's publications, for instance, ranged from 1784 to 1809. The fixing of this new repertoire in print ushered in a new era in the preservation and distribution of fiddle tunes. It seems as though a similar growth of repertoire of this then new style of dance music took place in other parts of the English-speaking world at about the same time. That is, in the closing decades of the 18th century and on into the early years of the 19th. Regrettably, not all, all areas had as strong a practice of publications of fiddle tunes as Scotland did, so our knowledge of this development in other areas is much less clear. Let's step aside from musical history for a bit and look at matters of social and cultural history particularly with an eye towards considering the question of an Irish strain that might be present in the fiddle music of the American South. While I bow to the knowledge of the cultural historians present, it is my understanding that prior to the famines of the 1840s and 50s, the vast majority of those who came to these shores from Ireland were the so-called Scotch-Irish or Ulster Scots, i.e. people who left Scotland in the 17th century and settled in Ulster province in Northern Ireland, and then in turn migrated to the American colonies during the first half of the 18th century. These people were primarily Presbyterian, so as I learned from Dr. Um, Glassie's lecture last night, there was really quite a mix here. Um, many of them were Presbyterians and came in several waves. Historian Roger Daniels identifies five pulses of immigration. The last of these was in the period 1771 to 1775, but most of the Ulster immigrants who settled in the Appalachians had come earlier, by about 1750 or before. Catholic Irish from other parts of the country moved here as well, but many came as indentured servants or other laborers and tended to become dispersed throughout the general population. 
Kirby Miller, writing of 17th and 18th century Irish immigration, notes that for a variety of reasons, most, Catholics, most Irish Catholics in North America never coalesced into permanent, distinctive ethnic communities, and further that, since the great majority of early immigrants were single males, marriage usually entailed absorption into colonial Protestant family and community networks. It is important to understand the chronology here, important to understand and underscore. The migrations of the Ulster Scots were taking place before or around the time in which the new form and style of dance music in Europe was developing, and most were already here well before the time in which extensive repertoire seems to have developed. Frankly, we know virtually nothing about any music that these early immigrants might have brought with them. If they did bring any fiddle tunes, they would be very early ones, any reels that is, tunes that likely never got collected in either printed or manuscript compilations. The earliest documentation of fiddle tunes from the southern regions of the US remains George Knopf's Virginia Reels from around 1839, 1840. This work contains tunes of varied probable origins. The publication includes a fairly strong Scots element, but not an Irish one. If Knopf tells us anything about the music of the Ulster, Ulster Scots who settled in the South, it is that it was much more strongly Scottish than it was Irish in flavor. Documentation of tunes from the North, that is New England, is considerably better. A few reels that might be familiar to players today can be found in manuscripts from around the time of the Revolutionary War and begin showing up in increasing numbers in printed collections from New York, Boston, Albany, and elsewhere in the early 19th century. Some of these were imported tunes, such as Flowers of Edinburgh, but more were new tunes, American tunes, built on the same model as the older ones. The new country might not have produced anyone on the level of Neil Gow, but American fiddlers clearly were writing new tunes. This gives credence to the idea that the modern fiddle tune repertoire developed from the late 18th century onward and that it did so regionally. Let's go back for a bit and look at the tunes that do in fact constitute something of a common repertoire between American and old world fiddlers. Again, although neither Ricky Skaggs nor the Alabama fiddlers cited by Grady McQuiney give specifics about the tunes they characterize as being the same, just with different names, ones that are often played at festivals and concerts when musicians from various traditions are called upon to perform together include Soldier's Joy, which is, most, which is easily the most universally known fiddle tune, Miss or Mrs. McLeod's Reel, known to Southern old-time musicians as Did You Ever See the Devil, Uncle Joe, or Hop High Ladies, and Lord MacDonald's Reel, known in old-time tradition as Leather Bridges. Let me go to the next slide here where there's a... Maybe go to the next slide. Can you convince it to move, John? There we go, thank you. Um, what was it? At the recent Celtic Appalachia concert, for instance, that I mentioned earlier, Dan Neely, one of the performers who took part in the show playing tenor banjo, reported that at the end of a segment featuring all the assembled banjo players, the group got together and, in Dan's words, all played Miss McLeod's, which the old-timey bluegrass guys called Did You Ever See the Devil, Uncle Joe? Joe. It was one of a small number of tunes raised that we could all agree upon on the spot. A somewhat longer list of common tunes might include those shown on this slide. Here we go. Soldier's Joy, Miss McLeod's Reel, and McDonald's Reel that I mentioned earlier. Um, fairy Dance, known in the South as Old Molly Hare. Fisher's Hornpipe, which is pretty universal and comes from London. Um, Miller of Drone, which in American becomes Grey Eagle. Mason's Apron, um, which becomes Wake Up Susan and Redbird, and any number of other variants in this, in this country. My Love, She's But a Lassie Yet. Um, again, traveling under lots of different names. Um, Devil's Dream, or the Scots know it as the Devil Among the Tailors and the Braves of Octertire, which became Billy in the Low Ground in this country. Two things notable about the tunes on this list. They are all Scottish in origin, and they, or except maybe Fisher's Hornpipe, and they all surface in the documentary record in the last two decades of the 18th century or the first decade of the 19th century, long after the Scotch-Irish emigrations. They do not constitute any evidence of any ancient, deep-seated Celtic cultural connection but most likely they owe their popularity either directly or indirectly to their frequent appearance in print. Now can we find any tunes in the southern U.S. repertoire, any, any Irish tunes in the southern U.S. repertoire? John, can you kick it one more time, please? This is almost the world's most simple PowerPoint presentation. This is it. Um, some that are of likely Irish origin might include the following. Um, a tune called, in the south, Stony Point, Wild Horse, or Pigtown Fling, um, Temperance Reel, um, known by various titles in the South, 
a tune the Irish people know as Over the Moor to Maggie, which comes up as Waynesboro in Kentucky. Greenfields of America has some, credence, uh, some circulation in Shippingsport, which is the name of a, a town near mm, Louisville or Lexington, I forget which. Tom Ward's Downfall, um, a very pretty rare Kentucky tune known as Merriweather, Merriweather. And Kitty's Wedding, Kitty's Wedding, a uh, common Irish hornpipe these days, actually first surfaces in Providence in 1847. The Boys of Blue Hill, I was talking with Rick about that a minute ago, first turns up in the Knopf collection. It's a common tune in Ireland now, did it originate there or what? We don't know. The Job of Journey Work, an Irish set dance, is probably the progenitor of the American tune known as Over the Waterfall. But what we must note about all of these is that they do not surface in the documentary record until well into the 19th century. They may well have been in circulation prior to that time, but we have no way of knowing that. Indeed, there is virtually no documentation of a body of Irish reels prior to the middle of the 19th century. The collections of Piper O'Farrell from the first two decades of the 19th century contain only a few reels, and it is not until the Levy collections of 1858 and 1873, which were in fact published in London, and then some of the collections issued by Boston publisher Elias Howe in the third quarter of the 19th century that any substantial body of Irish reels found their way into print. This begs the question, were they there and not documented, or were they simply not there? An answer to this question is far beyond the scope of this paper and beyond the range of my own serious work, but there is some thought that perhaps the development of much of the repertoire of what we now know as Irish traditional instrumental music occurred in the 19th century and not before. Captain Francis O'Neill lamented the absence of much dance music from the work of such noted early collectors as Bunting, Petrie, and Joyce. And he noted in the introduction to his collection, Waifs and Strays of Gaelic Melody, this is a quote from O'Neill, of the 2,819 numbers in the Bunting, Petrie, and Joyce collections combined, 300, or about 11%, could be considered dance music of all sorts, not just reels, dance music. O'Neill further notes that the great disparity between the number of airs and dance tunes in such noted collections plainly indicates that the former are the more ancient and diverse, diversified, because singing is a universal accomplishment while skill in instrumental music is limited and of comparatively recent development. It is quite apparent also that an appreciable number of dance tunes have been evolved from airs and marches um, since the Irish or Union bagpipe and fiddle supplanted the harp in the latter half of the 18th century. That's again, that's still quoting from O'Neill. Another observation to be made about several of the American cognates of Irish tunes on my list, including Waynesboro, Shipping Sport, Merriweather, and the various names under which Temperance Reel is known, is that their circulation in southern old-time tradition seems to have been largely in the area of central and northern Kentucky. How might we account for this partic one, particular, one particular region of Irishness? Possibly through the presence of Irish workers at the waterfronts along the Ohio River. But again, this is a 19th century phenomenon. And this area of Kentucky is not part of Appalachia, it's more the bluegrass region to the, to the west of the mountains. So, if the evidence for an Irish strain in American, Southern American fiddle music is so thin, why then is the notion of Irish roots so prevalent? What's going on here? In an early era, the, that is the first half of the 19th century, there was a widespread notion that American folk song, particularly Appalachian folk song, represented some sort of pure Anglo-Saxon past of our culture. This phenomenon has been well studied and much discussed among folklorists in more recent times. But we now seem to be replacing this with the notion of a Celtic past. Bill C. Malone, who is the Dean of Country Music Scholars, has discussed this puzzling switch in presumed cultural ancestry in a number of places. In a 1997 article titled, Neither Anglo-Saxon nor Celtic, the Music of the Southern Plain Folk, Malone comments, we have been assured on record liner notes, in the public statements of a few country musicians, and in at least one book, that Celtic musical traits and styles can easily be discerned in the playing and singing of southern country musicians. Buttressed by that faith, and emboldened perhaps by an enmity towards any and all things English, or perhaps by the desire to deny the prominence of black influence in country music, such observers imagine the strains of a Celtic bagpipe whenever they hear the drone of a country fiddle or banjo. They seek cultural legitimacy for country music by linking it to an ancient tradition, but instead obscure our understanding of it under a murky veil of romanticism. That's still a quote from Malone. And herein lies what is, to my mind, the biggest problem with the promotion of the concept of Irish roots of American fiddling. It promulgates a romanticized, one-dimensional, superficial view of complex matters of musical history. Rather than seeking an informed, nuanced understanding of the history of the broad repertoire of American fiddle tunes, a body of music that is both musically and culturally, culturally diverse, the matter is reduced to the intellectual equivalent of a soundbite. Why should we privilege what is really quite a small portion of the overall repertoire 
at the expense of all the other threads and layers that comprise the whole. I suggest that instead of attempting to invest the entire world of Southern fiddling with the patina of antiquity and notions of Celticism, we should applaud and celebrate the totality of what is, after all, a vibrant, living musical tradition, a tradition that is, by its very nature, American. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.